Jeffrey Word. And thank you, Brother Dan, for your prayer. And it sounded as though that rendition of uh, the hymn was sung by Sister Helena Melanowski, if I'm not mistaken. Um, as I was sitting listening to it, I thought those are lovelier words than I remembered them being. And I was just so delighted to have that hymn uh, to open our session. We did meet briefly with the Delaware Valley Brethren this morning, and they wish to convey their love and greetings to all of you. We also bring you love and greetings from the Dawn family. Um, things have changed. Uh, we are uh, physically centered in Orlando, Florida now, but still all across the world, all across the country, uh, through electronic means, uh, many workers are still lending a hand to promoting the message of the gospel of the kingdom. And we thank God for that. Sister Janet and I are delighted to be here together with you today. And we're looking forward to the morning sessions on prophets from the Old Testament. Most, I'm sorry, Abraham has been identified as a prophet. Now, if we read the account of his life in the book of Genesis, we see nowhere where he predicted future events overtly. But prophesying is, in addition to speaking of events that are yet to happen, predicting the future, prophesying also means to publicly expound the truths that God has revealed. And Abraham certainly did that, if not in word, in action. And the statement is so true that actions speak louder than words. And we are thankful to our Heavenly Father for giving us the account of Abraham and the events of his life and those things that pertain to the establishment of the kingdom of God. I think of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14, which says here we have no lasting or continuing city but we seek the city that is to come. And isn't that true? Isn't that why we're gathered here together today? We're all seeking that city which is to come. And it is that city which will govern this earth in righteousness, in purity, in peace, in light, in generosity, and in love. It will govern the world teaching them once again the principle that they are their brother's keeper. That countries need not compete, that countries need not build or amass multi-billion dollar armies with weapons of mass destruction to slaughter their fellow human beings, but to realize that all are God's creatures. And the brotherhood of mankind under the rulership of Christ will find their hearts so rejoicing, lifting up in song to the Heavenly Father for the great salvation that he has effected. Abraham, by his life, was a prophet. He was a prophet of the coming kingdom of God. He was a prophet of the fact of the resurrection of the dead. And thirdly, he was a prophet of the seed of promise, the Christ. And so as we look at the scriptures, we hope to identify some of these events and some significant points in them. Abraham was the son of Terah. And Terah <clears throat> lived 70 years, and then he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now we find that uh, genealogy in Genesis chapter 11, and that was verse 26. But we must note something here that Terah is stated to have lived 70 years and he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. But we don't think that the order of sons listed is chronological. We think that the order of sons listed is significant of their station in the plan of God. That Abram is listed first because of the great weight, the great consequence that he uh, 
uh, put upon the plan of God. And Nahor is listed last because he died before the uh, story of Abram and Nahor really developed. <clears throat> As further confirmation of this fact, we continue reading in Genesis chapter 11 of Terah's descendants, and I'll read 27 through 32. These are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So Terah was 205 years old when he died in Haran. And the Lord called Abram to go into the land of Canaan after the death of Terah. We continue reading in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Well, Abram left Haran after Terah died and Terah was 205 years old. It's simple math. To subtract 75 from 205 and realize that Terah begat Abram when he was 130 years old. Abram's oldest brother then would have been Haran, born 60 years prior. So it is no wonder that his nephew Lot is a full grown man and able to travel with him into the land of Canaan. Interesting also that the time of Terah's death, I'm sorry, that the age of Terah's, Terah when Abram was born was 130. If we add up all the begots going back to the time of the flood, we can calculate that the year that Abram was born is the same year that Noah would have died. We don't think this is a coincidence. Noah was the first of the patriarchs after the flood and the Lord wanted continuity of the patriarchs. And so it is wonderful to us that in the Lord's reckoning, Abram is born the same year that Noah dies. And in essence, the torch was passed to Abram. There is a series of writings called the Mishnah or the oral law that the Jewish people have studied for centuries. And part of that account speaks of, no, I'm sorry, speaks of Abram fleeing from the presence of Nimrod. You know, Nimrod lived in the area of Chaldea. And Nimrod uh, promoted other gods. And he actually promoted himself as a god. But Abram was unique in that he was a monotheist, the first true upstanding monotheist in the midst of a uh, polytheistic world. 
The story goes that Abram fled from the presence of Nimrod and went to live with Shem. You know, Shem lived 150 years uh, and died uh, in Abram's life. So they were contemporary. We think there that the Lord was able to bless Abram further by his association with Shem. Shem conveying to him all the messages that were generated in the book of Genesis prior to uh, Abram's fleeing from Nimrod. And we think that there also, there may have been a handing over of something very valuable. You know, when we read in Genesis, we read a story and then we read, these are the generations of, or in the Hebrew, these are the Toledah of. And the Toledoth, scholars recognize, means the tablets, the writings. The history of humankind had been recorded from the beginning. Those writings were saved, we believe. And at the time of the flood, they had been passed from Noah to Shem. And Shem now would have passed those on to Abram, who would have safeguarded them. And then likewise, pass them on to Isaac, and Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob to the 12 tribes of Israel, so that eventually Moses would have them as he wrote the account of the book of Genesis. Just an interesting side point. But in doing this, in preserving these writings, in gathering these Toledoth for future generations, Abram served as a prophet of the Lord safeguarding the message of Genesis. Well, Abram departed from Haran and went into the land that the Lord had promised him. Genesis, Galatians chapter three, beginning with verse six, tells us this, that Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached beforehand the gospel to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. I love that verse. I love it because... If we had to have a distillation of what the message of the gospel is all about, there it is. It was preached before to Abraham. In you shall all the nations be blessed. And dear brethren, is that not at the core of our Christian belief? Is that not an essential doctrine of the Bible students? Well, of course it is. And we cherish it greatly. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Continuing to the end of Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, we have this clear affirmation. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, the mystery hid from ages and generations, but now made manifest to the saints, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise that the seed would bless all nations. Well, the twisted message that uh, some aspects of Christianity have taught for centuries is that it is only Christians in the present time who will receive salvation. But as the seed of Abraham, they are to bless all nations. So it must be that the Lord saves more than just his church. And that is a fact. The church will act as the seed of Abraham together with their Lord Jesus Christ as their head reaching out to mankind, bringing healing and hope. 
we all look forward to that so much. So Abram was a great teacher also in the fact that he trusted God, he believed God, he exercised faith in what God said, and that was counted to him for righteousness. Paul picks this theme up in Hebrews chapter 11. We'd like to read verses 8 through 16. By faith, Abraham, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. Well, we know from Stephen's discourse in the book of Acts that Abraham did not receive really in his lifetime the ground, the country that he sought for, not even a square foot to set his foot upon. More on that in just a moment. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And we know that that is the new Jerusalem, soon to descend upon the earth for the blessing of all. To us, it is a powerful testimony to the fact of the resurrection of the dead that God had promised the land of Canaan to Abram and Stephen and Paul both acknowledged that they did not receive what had been promised. Well, the promises of God are all yea and amen. Dear brethren, does not this prove the resurrection, that Abraham will be brought back from the dead to at last receive that inheritance that God had promised him. That's powerful. We'll see another powerful testimony, actually two more powerful testimonies, in which the life of Abraham is prophetic of the resurrection of the dead. But let's continue on. Abraham is living in the land of Canaan. This is the land God had promised. Go forth there, Abraham, and I will bless you, was the assurance of God. And so Abraham is living his life there, you know, sh shepherding the, the herds and uh, taking care of daily business. And then a great famine comes into the land. Oh, my goodness. This is a disaster. God promised us this land. And now look. There's a, a, a terrible famine. There's a terrible, terrible uh, drought in the land. And so to survive the drought, Abraham decides to go down to Egypt. Now let's read about that because there's a very interesting point here. In Genesis 12, 10, now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was severe in the land. 
And again, seemingly a disaster. But the Lord will use this famine to further his plans. We will see. When he was about to enter Egypt, Abram said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, oh, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, you are my sister. And that was a half-truth, wasn't it? Say, you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Another seeming disaster. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Verse 16 identified all that he had, and we think these are riches that were gained in the land of Egypt. Sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants. I think that one of the female servants was named Hagar. And Hagar enters so mightily into the story of Genesis and enters very profoundly into the Apostle Paul's argument about the law covenant and the new covenant in Galatians, the fourth, fourth chapter. So it was very important, a seeming disaster, a famine in the land, a drought. They're forced to go to Egypt. And the Lord overrules that a female servant, Hagar, joins their company and returns with them. Well, the story unfolds. We know that Abram and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, were barren, uh, their union had not produced the heir that they had hoped for. And so Sarah gave Hagar, her maid servant, to Abram as a surrogate mother. And we know that the product of that union was Ishmael. Well, Ishmael had problems. He was described elsewhere in scripture in his adult years as a wild ass of a man, hard to control, high-minded, wild. Well, Genesis 21 verse eight tells us that the child grew and was weaned and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. And so Sarah says to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. Abraham loved Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, do not be displeased because of the boy and because your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. Well, we know that uh, Ishmael's wandering in the wilderness with his mother Hagar was very strenuous for them. And that at one point it seemed that Ishmael was on the verge of perishing. But the angel of the Lord pointed out to Hagar 
the well of the oath. And she was able to dip into the waters and revive Ishmael. Many Bible students have looked at Hagar, as Paul suggested, as a picture of the Mosaic law covenant. And Ishmael as the seed of that covenant, or natural Israel. And it is when the well of the oath, when the waters of truth, when the promises of God to the nation of Israel are looked to again, are rediscovered, that they will receive invigorating strength and strength to continue. Well, Ishmael would play another important part in the plan of God. We know that one of his descendant daughters was uh, the wife of Esau. And we know that when Joseph was disfavored of his brothers, when he was put into the well and then brought out to be sold off into slavery by a passing caravan, that the caravan was composed of Ishmaelites, cousins in a sense, cousins of Joseph. And in their care, and we, we doubt not that our Heavenly Father, our mighty Jehovah God, arranged things thus. They would realize that these are family ties and per perhaps took good care of Joseph. And perhaps they sought to sell, sell him off into slavery into the best possible situation, into the luxurious home of an Egyptian official. And the story goes on from there, of course, uh, the marvelous overrulings of God in the life of Joseph. But all these things were because Abram listened to God and trusted in him and didn't say, no, no, I, I want Ishmael to stay. He's, he's my strength. He's my son. And the Lord was going to give Abram the seed that he had promised. And sure enough. When Sarah was beyond the way of women in her words, and Abram was a hundred years old, Sarah conceived and she bore the promised son, Isaac. It was a miracle. And Isaac would again figure heavily in the prophecy of the resurrection of the dead. And again, we spoke of Abram prophesying or publicly teaching, not by force of words, but by actions, which speak louder than words. <clears throat> this is recorded in Genesis, the 22nd chapter. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. The shock that that must have been to Abraham is not recorded for us in the scripture. But I can scarcely imagine how those words hit him profoundly, but we don't have any wrestlings of conscience. We don't have any um, negative pushback on Abram's part. It just says early in the morning, Abram rose up, saddled his donkey, took his two young men, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. Abraham had great confidence that the Lord could deliver Isaac out of death great confidence that the Lord would work out a way in such an extreme situation that he could confidently say to the two young men who were with them, wait here and we will come to you again. 
Well, we know the story. Um, Isaac says to his father, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abram says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they went and he put him on the altar and bound him and took the knife to slaughter him. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. In analyzing this event in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we begin with verse 17, and these are Paul's observations. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. And so by this action, Abraham mightily prophesied of the coming resurrection of the dead. Abraham's life is such a public teaching on the fact of the resurrection. As we saw earlier, the fact that he did not receive so much as to set his foot upon in the land of Canaan implies strongly that he must be raised from the dead to receive the promise of God. And here, offering up Isaac, as our Heavenly Father was to offer up his son, showing that his heart was knit with the purposes of God and that he was faithful and loyal to God, that's a tremendous testimony too. That's a tremendous prophecy or public teaching of the complete trust that we may have in Jehovah God. Abraham figured in Jesus' teaching on the resurrection of the dead as well. And I was very, very struck by this just a, a year or two ago. The, the weight and the power of it really hit me. And the record is in Mark 12. And it is when the Sadducees came to Jesus to tempt him. And, you know, they had the story of seven brothers and uh, the first one marries a wife and he dies. He leaves no child. The next brother takes the widow to raise up offspring for his brother, seven brothers, and she goes through them all, and they, they think they've really got Jesus nailed here. And so <clears throat> they ask the question, in the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, because the Sadducees did not believe it. Have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Well, no wonder after a while the Sadducees and the Pharisees gave up trying to reason with Jesus because he was just so superior in his reasoning to them. But I love that statement. 
I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he is not a God of the dead, but a God of the living. Well, brethren, these are just a few of the wonderful points, wonderful lessons in the life of Abraham. The great faith that he exercised, he by that became the father of faith. And in his extreme circumstances, dear brethren, we realize that each of us has trials that seem more weighty than we may be able to bear. But the Lord's strength is sufficient for all things, isn't it? And the Lord is faithful, who will also do it. Brother Chairman, we turn the meeting back to you.